Thanks, guys. So I want to share a little bit of my identity story with you today. And like all good identity stories, it starts in the 80s. Um, so it was December 1989. It was the day of the church Christmas pageant, and I was ready. I was looking good. My hair was perfectly crimped in a side ponytail. My bangs were also crimped. I don't know why we did this to ourselves. I was in my hunter green taffeta and velvet and lace dress with matching tights and shoes. Um, I was ready to go. This was the day where I got to perform my first ever solo. I got to sing on stage at church. I was about five or six years old. And uh, in this pageant, I was singing Away in a Manger to baby Jesus. So I got to be part of the nativity scene. You had the wise men from the east, you had the shepherds from the fields, and then you had me recently off of a glamour shots shoot or something. I don't know. It somehow worked. So, so that was it. And it must have gone well. I don't remember it super well. Um, but it must have gone well because the music director uh, actually came to me and said, we want you to do special music in our church every month. We're going to put you on a special rotation. You get to sing. So I got to be uh, trained up in the church, being on stage. This was the beginning of my long and illustrious musical career. I was the girl that got to go into that sacred booth in the back of Family Christian Center, you know, and find the cassette tapes of Amy Grant so that while I'm singing, I have like a full horn section behind me. <laughs> So, so this was my life, and I have a six-year-old niece, and she just won a science competition, and I saw her receive her award, and I thought, this is so special, because this is a moment where she knows she's good at something, she's going to grab hold of this, it's going to give her confidence, it's going to help her grow in her skill, and what a, what a special thing to happen at such a young age. I can say that now. But my reality as a six-year-old, uh, being on stage, being in front of people, was anything but a blessing for me. Uh, the reality that I walked through was one of uh, self-criticism, self-hatred, and self-harm. And that happened from a very young age. After I would sing, or even as I'm preparing to sing, my entire body would react with anxiety, fear. I would feel sick. Um, when I got on the stage, I would get off as quickly as possible, and I would go and cry because it wasn't good enough. And I would go and hide because I didn't want to have to hear people's response or hear what they thought. And it wasn't the criticism that I was afraid of. It was the compliment because I didn't want them to see on my face. I was trying to hide that I didn't believe them. This, again, was my reality. And it wasn't just on stage. This was my reality in daily life. It was getting up. It was, it was going out in public. It was me just by myself. And all of this was happening in, um, in parallel with a life that I truly loved God. And I knew that he loved me. I was in church. I believed, this, I believed the word. But, but this was a mask that I wore. Fast forward to my 20s. I'm listening to a podcast on spiritual warfare. It sounds super exciting. It was super dry. I was taking notes just to stay awake. I was like, there has to be something good in here. It's going to come. Um, so something did. Um, one of the points that he made was uh, oftentimes you'll know that you're either under demonic oppression or you're in the middle of spiritual warfare. If you start hearing voices in the second or third person instead of the first so in other words, instead of me thinking, I want salad, I would hear, you want donuts, or she wants Chick-fil-A, you know, that kind of thing. So, so that's the kind of thing that you, that you would be hearing. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's ever happened to me and just was kind of doing an audit of my past. Like, has there been a moment where that really happened? And it you know how that, the flashes come. It was like a flashback. And I'd thought of this memory before. It wasn't like the first time I'd remembered it. But it was the first time I put it in this context. I remembered being a little girl, so small, that I went in my mother's bathroom and I couldn't see myself in the mirror. I had to climb up onto the toilet, climb up onto the counter, sitting on my knees, looking at myself in the mirror. And I was sobbing. And as I'm looking at myself in the mirror, this is what I'm saying. Some girls aren't good enough. 
Some girls aren't pretty. Some girls shouldn't be heard. Some girls shouldn't be seen. At that moment in my life, at a very young age, I believe that a shadow fell over me that I walked in for the rest of my life. It was a tainted mirror that I was looking into, and it affected every single interaction. It affected self-talk, it affected talk with others, it affected ministry, and I had to fake a lot of things. So this is what I realized in my 20s, and two things happened. First, I got angry. I got mad because I got ripped off. Something had been stolen from me, and I got mad for that little five-year-old that the enemy didn't care about kicking while she was so little and putting herself out there. I got mad. So then the second thing that happened was I got determined. I need to overcome this. Something needs to change. I can't live in this anymore. I have to be free. But I needed more than an overcoming attitude. I needed the Spirit of God to deliver me. There was a deliverance that needed to happen because it was bigger than me. I already knew I wasn't seeing in reality. I actually just watched a colorblind simulator. Have you guys ever watched those where it gives you the filter of what a colorblind person sees? And it's hard to see the reds and the greens or the blues and the purples. And my brother's colorblind, so I was interested in seeing that. And I thought, wow, he has no concept of the reality that I get to walk in and see every day. It's like, that's where I was. So I couldn't talk myself into saying, see green better, see red better. I needed something to be transformed. So I prayed, and I, in, in my way of thinking, when we're, when we're talking about deliverance, I think there's two main ways that God does this. One is that, as Ryan was mentioning earlier, it's that crossing over moment. It's going over the Red Sea. You were a slave, you are now free. There's an entire ocean in between. You have burned the bridges, you've burned the boats, you're not going back. This is the story that Bob, of Bob's life of being delivered from alcoholism, right? I and mean, a lot of us have those. Those are those miraculous delivery, instantaneous moments. Those are the ones we want because they're a lot easier. They're a lot easier to get from one side to the other. But God delivers us in another way too. And that's the wandering part. It's the shedding off of the sin every single day. It's the changing and the transformation and the restructuring of your chemical makeup and your brain and your way of thinking. It's the being renewed day by day. And God can transform us and deliver us in that way too. So that's how I was walking that out. I was still getting up on the stage. And every time I did, God would do something. He would shed something. He would change something. And I walked this out for a while and I thought, you know, this is going to be my life journey. It's going to happen all the time. Until one day. <laughs> and I told Brandon, I want to pause on this, on this line. Until one day. There's a lot of hope in that statement, right? When you're reading a story or watching a movie and you get to the part, it was always like this. Until one day, something happened. And I want to tell you, I wanted to stay here for a moment because there's so much hope in this statement and we have this hope, every one of us, for today, for tomorrow, for eternity. One day, it will all be restored. We will all be renewed. It will be completely new. So here's my one day. One day, I woke up from a spiritual dream. God had given me this dream. I'm writing it down. And he's speaking to my spirit and telling me, this is for that girl, this girl that you know. And I'm like, Cool, I'll pray about this and agree with you, Lord. And he says, no, 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 you need to deliver this to her. I'm like, eh, this girl does not like me, Lord. I would go as far as saying this girl hates me. I don't want to give her this message. She's not going to hear me. It's not going to go well. Somebody else can do it. Nope, you, you got to tell her. You got to speak this word to her. So like a good daughter, I say, sure, yeah. Uh, if I run into her today and we end up sitting next to each other and there's like an extra half an hour and nobody's talking, I will share this with her. So <laughs> we end up at a concert sitting next to each other and the, there's technical difficulties so the music's not starting for half an hour. I'm not getting out of it. So I, so I tell her 
this word that God had given me for her. She's sobbing. The spirit of God is so precious and sweet there. And she says, Stephanie, I I received this word of God from you. I hated you. Will you forgive me? And I say, yes, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. And I can't describe this moment to you. Lightning, presence of God, warmth, friendship, love. Jesus was there. And he's speaking to me and he says, the girl who hated you delivered this message. You are receiving this word for yourself, from yourself, from me. And I'm like, ooh, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? This, I delivered a word to a girl who hated me. She received it and asked forgiveness. I was now receiving that word for myself from a girl who hated me. And I was receiving forgiveness. And here's what that word was, really quickly, because I'm already running late. I saw, in my dream, I saw a horse running inside a pen, running around and around. And I could see it was anxious and frantic, and it needed to get out. And when I watched it, the, most, the biggest impression I got was my heart was aching for the horse. I knew it was beautiful and strong, and it needed to be free. It needed to be let out. And God's hand of mercy reached down and opened up the gate and let it free. And as my heart kind of, again, started aching for the loss of so much lost time, so much lost energy, he said, don't fret about what was wasted. This will all fuel the fire to run farther and to bring others free. That's the word that I received that day. And you know, when God meets you and encounters you in a very supernatural way, sometimes you wonder, how is this going to, how's this going to affect my day-to-day? How's this going to affect my, my normal daily life? I'll tell you what happened for me. The next morning I woke up, I looked in the mirror, and I did not recognize myself. And I didn't change. My eyes had been opened. And that shadow that I'd been walking in for years, for decades, Suddenly, I was in the light of the reality of God's love. I was staring into his glory, which was my own reflection, his love for his creation, for his daughter, who believed him about me. And that is the transformation that is available for each of you today. The reality of God's love, looking in his face, knowing that you are hidden in his love, that you are acceptable to him, that you can approach the throne of his grace with confidence because you look just like Jesus. Can we pray together now? All right. (laughs) Father God, I am humbled by the tenacity with which you track us down with your love. You go after us. And as much as we feel like we have to plead for transformation and change, God, would you rescue? God, would you help? God, would you restore? God, would you save? You desire even more so to give those things freely and to have us with hearts that are willing to receive. So God, right now I pray that everyone here that is suffering behind a mask or is suffering looking in a tainted mirror, God, would you bring the reality of Jesus, your love, your acceptance, and the truth of your word in your name. Amen.